My name is Linda Duffy and I am the Disability Coordinator here at the 174 Trust. I've been working here for about 14 years. Before that I was an office manager, an accounts manager and I sat in an office on my own with staff outside. It was a very structured, rigid job. And then I had a son, a second son, and he had Down syndrome. I'd come out of work for a year to take time out to be involved with Alex and give him all the attention that he needed. I felt I couldn't do that at work. When Alex was born, nobody in work congratulated me. My staff or the clients that I spoke to on a daily basis, it was as if I had been off on holidays or disappeared off the face of the earth. But there was no congratulations. It was as if people were scared to mention it or I felt I didn't need to mention it because he had been born with a disability. It was very traumatic for us. We didn't know Alex was going to have Down syndrome, so it was a shock to us. But from the moment he was born, we knew he was our son, and that was all that mattered. For people not to mention his name, like he didn't exist, it was very hurtful. So that sort of helped me make the decision to take, which was supposed to be a year out. But in fact, I never went back. Before Alex was born, I was also an emergency foster mother, which meant we could have got a call if a child was being lifted out of their home that night. They could have came to us. And I always said to the social worker, I can take any type of child, but don't give me a child that's disabled. And I think now, you know, how life has turned and how I've came full circle. And now I have 50 disabled children <laughs> that I love to bits. I'm Amy and I'm a support worker here at the 174 Disability Project. I've been here for nearly just coming up to half a year and I love it. I like to be an active member within my community. Making a positive change is important to me and, and a positive impact in young people's lives. My name's Michal. I've been involved with the organisation for going on four months now and I absolutely love it because before I said I was just involved in sort of mainstream youth work. So I had no experience working with young people with disabilities and I must say coming here is one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. My name's Daniel and I've been a support worker at the 174 Trust Disability Project for just under two years now. The club runs three different programmes. On a Monday we have a adult group, so that's from 18 to 25. On a Tuesday we have an intermediate group and then on a Wednesday junior group as well. Over the three nights we have a range of activities we'll partake in. Some of the kids we like to partake in the karaoke because some have more of a musical side. Then the arts and crafts is for our kids who like to draw and paint and have a more creative. And the football is for the boys and the girls who like to do it. Well there's a wide range of uh, disabilities young people have here so the needs are, are very very different for each individual and I think we're very good at adapting to their needs. And so things like Down syndrome, balance problems, non-verbal, blind, there's a multiple range of disabilities that these young people have but the young people can achieve a lot. 
regardless of their disability and um, that's something that we try to remind them on a daily basis. I know I've only been here six months but seeing the young people progress has been amazing, you know, their confidence from when I've started to now, it's really transformed. The biggest thing I enjoy when working with our young people is it's just building relationships with them and finding out what they like, what they dislike. I just love it. Through working here I've realised that there's actually not a lot of support for young people with disabilities. It's the only place that I'm aware of in North Belfast. It's definitely a huge need for these type of young people. I've been a taxi driver. I've been taxiing for 174 for five or six years. We get the kids in at our homes and get them in the club and get them out for maybe an hour or two. It's not just a club we go to. Maybe we go to the park, the Cave Hill, the Odyssey, or elsewhere. Clubs like this are so important because it's cross community. On both sides, the, the fancier, the, the, I mean, their parents, and they love it, and they get kids going back and forward. So it's phenomenal again. My name's Riona. I first started here around five years ago. I was just a main hour post and over COVID, the first year of COVID, I got promoted to deputy coordinator. So I just really support Linda and help plan our activities, organise like transport. I communicate with the parents and make sure that the young people are coming and especially through COVID we've been a massive just about planning, being safe and putting all these procedures in place. Over the years there's been so many unbelievable moments. One that's always stuck with me from the day in art happened. There was this young boy who used to go to the youth group. We had a really special bond and he was so lovely. It came to a point where he was a wee bit ill. He was very ill actually and his biggest dream was to see a Ferrari in real life because he's never seen one because they were his favourite car. And this fella who had worked here before, you called him Sean, he had actually organised, put a status up on Facebook and organised, um, asked anybody that the, had a Ferrari could they possibly bring it to the 174, that there's a young boy who is, is, his, is his biggest dream to ever see one. Three or four different fellas got back to him and agreed to come and we ended up having a big massive event. The boy's face was absolutely priceless. He, he was in a wheelchair, so it's not as if he could get into the cars, but that didn't matter to him, like it didn't matter to him. It was just heartwarming and it was so magical and he was so thankful, he was, he was just so happy and it was an amazing time. And it just goes to show you what this programme's about, you know. Our young people have dreams and no matter how big or small, I hope the one day that they get to reach it, just like that little boy did. Some of our young people's biggest dream is so little, even just for making a new friend is their biggest dream or maybe even for our families, our family's biggest dream is to maybe hear their young people say their name or be able to speak and just to hear their child's voice. My name's Kiva and my daughter is Liara. Liara's just turned 18 years older. I fell pregnant with Liara just before I turned 19, so it was, it was a young mum. Me and her dad had been together from we were 16, so we were childhood sweethearts, and then fell pregnant with Liara, and normal pregnancy, normal birth, everything was very normal until she wasn't developing as normal, so she wasn't, I could, eight months wasn't sitting upright, wasn't doing things that she should have been doing, developing was just still laying there. And I was young and didn't realise that she wasn't developing right. But my mum and sister had said, you know, maybe bring her to the doctors. And we started physio and that. And then at 16 months, she was diagnosed with global developmental delay with a whole range of diagnoses now, hypotonia, um, which is low muscle tone, epilepsy, hearing loss, um, a whole range of different things through the through the years that it was like a slow kind of different diagnosis at different time. When she was first diagnosed, it broke my heart and it was very hard, you know. I was in denial, most definitely was in denial and didn't believe it. I thought, no, she'll be fine and she'll go to mainstream. But she had to go to main cap nursery. But the first time when I took her to main cap, there was a, a child that came in and was like tube fed and, and couldn't smile. And that's the first day I went, she's going to be okay.
because she could crawl and clap and do things that many other kids couldn't do. So that's the first I kind of started seeing what she could do, not what she couldn't. We never got a diagnosis to Wiley or had um, all the different disabilities she has, but we only discovered three years ago so that it's actually me and my husband's genetics that we have, we, me and him both carry a rare chromosome. We took part in the study, I think it was done in America, and it came back that me and Declan both have a spot of five gene, which is very, very rare. So the chances of us having it and then meeting and marrying Havel and Yara is even slimmer and then there's still a one in four chance that it can cause the disabilities Lear has so it's, she's very rare who we girl and what, and what she has. And when people sometimes kind of look at pity because Lear is disabled I just say she's happy and healthy and that's all you want for your child. My name is Paul McCusker. I've been a councillor here in North Belfast now from 2017. For me, being involved in the council as a local politician is about giving local people a voice of, of, of various different issues that affect people living in North Belfast. While it's a very challenging job, it's, it's also very enjoyable when you can actually can go out and make a difference. In the community, you know, issues around housing, health, antisocial behaviour, young people's needs, um, pe people with disabilities, um, and been very passionate about the, the project that's based at 174 Dunkirk, which is a, a, an amazing uh, project in terms of actually giving young adults and young people who've got physical or mental health disabilities, the opportunity to actually learn new skills, you know, education, personal development. And I've actually known a lot of these uh, young adults that come to the, the club um, and to see the, the development, you know, with them over, over a number of years is, is amazing. You know, they, they're able to come in and, and be in a safe place and, and learn new things. There's a lot more um, support that this project could be doing with as well. Um, and I know that they work very quietly um, and, and do a really, really great job. Um, when I was Deputy Mayor last year, um, I, I picked them as a charity. They deserve that recognition. For example, we had the lights, the, the lights of, the, of the project on, on City Hall. Um, we had the young people, the young adults down in the City Hall and they absolutely loved it, you know, the fact that they were being brought into the City Hall of the city where they live and they, they, they enjoyed that experience. There's definitely massive gaps, that I think, politically and also in the local community that we need to address um, to give young adults and young people who have got disabilities the opportunity to, to succeed and opportunity to actually feel part of society and, and not be forgot about. Young people with disabilities um, deserve um, access to support. Young people with disabilities deserve to be listened to. They deserve to, to, to have that opportunity to succeed in their lives and, 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 and reach their full potential. My name is Bill Shaw. I'm the CEO of 174 Trust, uh, which is the organisation that runs and owns the, the Duncan Complex, of which Duncan Arts Centre is, is an integral part. We've been in existence since the early 1980s. Um, I've had the privilege of being the director and now CEO since the 1st of May 1998. In the Duncairn Centre for Culture and Arts, former Duncairn Presbyterian Church, part of the Duncairn Complex, it certainly is an iconic building and a great facility. The Disability Project was in existence when I came here. It was always an important part of what 174 Trust did within the community, uh, working with particularly marginalised and vulnerable people. Uh, so it was always a, an important project w w within the overarching work that the, the Trust was involved in. I've always been uh, aware of the importance of the project for the people themselves that are involved um, because these are, these are folk that because of their disabilities, whether that's a learning or a physical disability or in some cases a combination of both, um, they're very much on the margins of society, um, can be pretty much invisible for a lot of people. On this side of COVID, one of the things I'm particularly proud of was when other projects that were dealing with equally marginalised people were closing down or going virtual. Linda came to me and said that we, we can't do that. There, there are families who, who are relying on the support and, and just the opportunity for the young people and the adults to, to be part of a group that still meets. Linda and her team uh, maintained that service right through from the initial lockdown in, in March uh, 2000, right through to the, to the present date without a break. Not only sustaining, but also developing it, because one of the new groups that emerged was the, the group 18 to 25 year olds. 
For years, I always had a problem with our children turning 18. Because when our children turned 18, social services wanted them to leave the club. And I knew these children had nowhere else to go. These children didn't have three or four nights at a mainstream youth club like their able-bodied peers. This was it. This was the end of the road, nearly. So I spoke to Bill, my director, and I asked him to have a bit of faith in me and let me run a project for 18 to 25-year-olds. Lynn and I had a heart-to-heart, -heart, uh, and she impressed upon me again the importance of this age group. Uh, and, and the need for a for a standalone service for, for that particular age group. So um, we went out on a limb. Um, we worked out some basic cost things that allow us to run it for a, for a 12 month period as a pilot project where we could prove uh, to statutory bodies and to, to, to funders that this, this was meeting an identified need. We now have 15 young adults. They're fantastic. And they just want to be treated like young adults. They want to do things that other young adults do, go out for a meal, go to the cinema, come together. Sometimes they don't need me to facilitate it, you know, a night's entertainment. They're very comfortable coming in and doing what young adults do, chilling out, laughing amongst each other, sharing stories. We're coming to the end of the first year, but now we need to find funding for it. I can't expect Bill to keep funding it for me. So we need the funders to hear what we're doing down here, to come and see it. One of the things I've always loved about the ethos at 174 Trust, we're about reconciliation and involvement and diversity. And that includes not just orange and green Protestant Catholic, that includes people with disabilities, people without. I would plead that anybody who's, who's watching this to say, you know, you know, get behind the 174 Disability Group, they deserve the support. Our young people, their disability doesn't define them, it makes them. Through Linda and her team's involvement are, are changing lives and, uh, and, and really making a difference and as a CEO that's all I can ask for. I'd like to think that I've helped some parents along the way who have been struggling and I'd like to think we've encouraged some children to maybe do things a bit more for themselves or live a bit independently, just to push themselves. So I've achieved that and I think I'll have done all right.